So I grew up knowing at a very early age that I wanted to be in broadcasting. And so while my girlfriends were all recording in high school days of our lives, I was recording Regis and Kathy Lee because like, <laughs> I just looked up to you so much. And, and then Thanks. as I've gotten older, what I appreciate is looking back at how you balanced the kids and the career and all the things, but yet it was always so evident to your viewers and fans of Kathy Lee that your babies were your priority. And I just yeah. really respect that. What was it like raising the kiddos in the public eye? Oh, it was wonderful. And it was uh, traumatic. And, you know, I mean, wonderful in the sense that I worked for Disney at the time. So they literally grew up at Disney World. <laughs> they got to they thought an exit an exit uh, sign meant that's where we go in because you know we never you know they I don't think they ever stayed they were stunned eventually that 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 you had to what do you mean stand in line for something I mean, but that was all for security reasons right because back then you know everything was it was pretty uh, wild and crazy times and uh, we couldn't go anywhere without like a scene but um, that wasn't because I was spoiling them by any means I've always. Uh, you know, I was bound and determined not to raise two um, egocentric, uh, obnoxious, self-absorbed little brats. The world does not need one more of those, you know. Right. It had to somewhat so, be a challenge, though, because, you know, in the public eye like that, you are, you know, afforded possibilities and things like the Disney example is a great sure. one that I'm sure that you had to really be um, intentional about that. Always. I think every parent has to be intentional about everything. I mean, there was no, at that time, social media when they were little. So I'm grateful for that. I don't know how, how different they would be. By the time they were into social media, they were really, uh, really um, very formed, intelligent, caring, generous human beings. So, mm. and and not stupid, you know, yeah. not, not, uh, not out to uh, shock the world or write a tell-all book or any of that. Not that they won't. I just asked them to wait till I die. You know, I don't want to read. just wait till I die and say anything you want. doesn't matter. I love it. I'll, I love be, it. I'll be with Jesus and I won't care. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. I can remember um, all the baby gifts that were coming your way. Were you yeah. even surprised at America's reaction to you totally. and motherhood? Yeah. You know, nobody had ever talked about their life for a living before Regis and I did it. Yep. And when I was surprised to become a mother at the age of 36, um, yeah, that's when Cody was born. Cass was born when I was 40. Uh, the outpouring of, of, of gifts from around the country. I got over 1000 handmade gifts, everything like cradles from Kentucky to, they had to come in crates to quilts. I, I mean, I don't know how many quilts and just, but handmade, you know, and it was, it was so moving to me and so touching. I just thought, I don't know who's out there watching every day. You know, you just, you can't be thinking about that. Uh, uh, you just can't, you got to just do your show for whoever it is that's out there. And I'd always just try to be authentic and people related to that. And I would talk about my sore nipples and my mastitis and my, you know, my whatever. And uh, they're sitting at home with their mastitis and their boobs out like torpedoes. And they're going, it's not just me that has pus and blood on my nipples. You know, <laughs> It was a whole different level of relatability. I'm not a freak. I'm not a, yes, exactly. <laughs> so I just tried to be honest with people, whether I was at the, the White House at a reception or something and had to pee so bad. I, you know, that kind of thing, you know, uh, you just, yeah, you're at the White House. And, and and if I just talked about how I was fabulous at the White House, I never wanted to do that. I never wanted anybody to be jealous. I wanted everybody to see the humanity in every situation, you know, because I always felt deeply humbled about everything that's happened in my life because I'm the last person in the world that ever expected it, Jennifer, last person. And still to this day, I'm like, Waldo, what am I doing here? I am just Waldo. You know what the heck am I doing there? Why am I with Kevin Costner here? Why am I with Al Pacino in my garden? Why am I with uh, the, the, the with the the Kennedys? Why am I you know with uh, Donald Trump? It's everywhere with everybody, and I'm going. No, I now I see why they're there. But what the hell are you doing there, Kathy? And I still feel that way. Yeah, and but Regis was the same way, even more so. Uh, Regis was uh, the, the the short little Italian slash uh, uh, Italian slash Irish guy, 
that uh, whose mother had always said to him, the poor house is right around the corner, Mr. Smarty Pants. And he believed her. And yeah. uh, so all of a sudden he gets this incredible success. Neither of us set out to be successful uh, with our talk show. We just thought we'd get a, we'd have a really good, uh, really good experience and a really successful talk show in New York. And it turned out to actually change the the, the whole uh, uh, complexion of daytime television. It just, you know, we, we made history changing it. And uh, but we didn't set out to do it. We just wanted to have fun. Yeah. You know, again, that relatability, though, that people because I think that humility that you both had and were able to exude over the air it was a game changer in what what television is and then you went on to do yeah. it again with Hoda and same thing so the topics were so real that you know moms like me at home at the time were okay these are my people yeah thank <laughs> yeah. you that, yeah yeah when people think of you as their friend mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing it's, it's the greatest compliment uh I was at Bloomingdale's one day and two things happened that I'll never forget. It's funny. Uh, one thing is I was waiting in it at the elevator elevator bank to go upstairs. And there's a guy so Wall Street, you couldn't even, you could almost tell, you know, exactly what firm he was with, you know? <laughs> yeah. And it just, it was it's just him and, and, and myself waiting to get on. And he's just, he looks over, just gives a sort of nod. And I, a little nod. And then we're waiting and waiting and waiting. It was taking a long time. Finally, he goes, I got to, I just got to tell you something. I'm going, oh, I don't like it when people say that because you never know where it's going to go. And he, he said, I got to tell you something. He says, I watch you and Regis every day. He said, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I do. And I thought that was so cute. Here's this guy that he, we obviously were giving him something he wanted. Yeah. I watch you. Every day. And then I, I was up in the, in the, some, one of the departments and a lot of women stuff around and Mayor, I was, shopping basically right next to Meryl Streep. Now, Meryl Streep at that time was one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Yeah. I still think she's one of the greatest actresses in the world, but you know, there was, there was everybody knew Meryl Streep and not one person went up to her. Not one person went up to Meryl Streep and she was able to do her shopping and get, you know, just very quietly and just, and get, she wasn't in trying to hide from anybody either. She's just, she was unapproachable because she was a big movie star. I, on the other hand, they, I was swamped. I had to leave because wow. I couldn't buy it I, because there were so many people. And instead of being um, upset about it, I just realized what a privilege that is that all these people feel comfortable enough with me, you know, to uh, to want to be with me, to want to talk to me, to want to take a picture or get an autograph or whatever it was. I've never resented it. Um uh, but I, I, the only time I've ever resented it is when my children were with me and they were getting almost stomped on because of people. I wonder Nobody, if there's ever kind of a regret of, oh, wow, have I talked about oh, them? Oh, much? Put them in even the with, even, yes, absolutely. Even, even, especially when we were going through things that were sort of called scandalous, which weren't at all, but they made it into something scandalous. For sure. They, they do, they knock over your, you know, your limping grandmother to get the, the picture, you know? They didn't care if it was my kids. And that's one of the main reasons I left the show with Reaches was to get a more, uh, a quieter life, uh, get away from the tabloids, get my, you know, heal my, my marriage, which had, which had been, you know, t uh, tried that yeah. time when Frank was unfaithful to me and uh, get away from all the bull and get away from the ugliness of it and the mean spiritedness of it and have, try to have a, a, as normal a life as we could have in Connecticut. I, turned my focus towards writing for theater and films and music then. And, and I was just enjoying my life until I got dragged back into TV. <laughs> thought, I'd stay, thought I'd stay one year with Hoda. And unfortunately, and fortunately, I fell in love with her. She's just, she's just sunshine in a bottle. And I just adore yeah. her. Yeah, she is. And that went on what for what? 11 years, I think, right? That one year turned it, into it was 11. 11 years. It was 11 years until I finally realized I am running out of time. <laughs> for all those childhood dreams that never came true because mm -hmm. I just didn't have the time for them. You know, right. people say to me all the time, why, how could you leave your dream job twice? Once with Regis and once with, um, uh, with Hoda. And I said, well, you guys are assuming that, that that was my dream job. It never was. When I was growing up as a young girl, uh, there were no talk shows. And certainly no female talk show hosts. Right. I, that was something I dreamed about. No, nobody had heard of it before. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do what Haley Mills and Annette Funicello were doing. They were Mouseketeers and they were in Disney movies. And they, you know, I said, 
that's what I want to do. Where do I get my ears? Where do I sign up for my ears? So, yeah. And I ended up writing a letter to, to, um, to Walt Disney when I was a uh, young girl, young girl, uh, and basically saying, dear Mr. Disney, um, I know, um, I know you, uh, you have a net Funicello and Haley Mills, but, uh, but I, you need to meet me. Uh, can you imagine the audacity? I said, I'm known for my expressions. Uh, uh, do you have a copy of that letter? I wish I did. No, oh, my mom had saved it, but it's long, long gone. But anyway, I just have the memory of it getting a letter back from Walt Disney. Now, obviously it was a form letter, but I didn't know. Yeah. It was so, it was so sweet. It was, it was just like I thought he would be. Dear Kathy, so happy to hear from you and so glad that you like my the movies we or something something sweet he says I um I just want to encourage you to pursue your dreams work hard whatever it was it was really a, like a you know cheerleader kind of movie a, a, a letter to me short but sweet and uh and then he uh and the last thing he said was and maybe one day we will work together and make movies and I just I mean just the thought that that Walt Disney thought maybe would I it inspired me yeah and I it was that famous uh, um. Uh, penmanship he had, you know, when he wrote his his uh, his name out, his signature, and I kept it for a long, long time, and I, I, I'll never forget it. And I ended up working for Disney, as I said, and I did several movies for him. He's long gone, but I'd like to think he was smiling from heaven. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Cody made his uh, first his debut in a movie uh, on the same movie that uh, Justin Timberlake did, a movie called Model Behavior. Oh, and that was that- under Disney too, right? Yeah, that that was a huge hit. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. So anyway, yeah, I've been blessed. But, you know, with every blessing comes challenges. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I, I I tried to protect my children. Every What I wanted them to be was completely aware that the sun does not, does not rise and set on you and the world does not revolve around you. God, God sits on the throne of this world uh, and he should be on the throne of your life. And the minute you get, you start thinking that you're all that, no, and not going to happen. Not going to happen on my watch. Now, when you're 21 and I've raised you to know right from wrong and to be polite and generous and kind and, and uh, friendly to people, not acting like you're ever, that you're better than them, then you make your own decisions. And I will not even give you my opinion unless you ask for them. And I've been true to that. Yeah. I bet that's a great... Um, segue into something else I wanted to talk about when you talk about not giving your opinion unless you're asked. So I'm about to be a mother-in-law for the first time. My youngest is getting married in April. Oh, con- we're yeah. in April. Yeah, in April. Yeah. Oh, congratulations! Sure. I hope you like her. I love her. She's very, she's very precious. But that relationship really matters to me. And you know, of course, by all accounts, it sure seems like you have done the mother-in-law role really well. And I wanted mm. to see what advice you might have for me. Well, first of all, you don't even look old enough to have a child that's getting married. <laughs> you look like Gidget. My gosh. Um, I don't even you know, remember who Gidget was, but she was young. I so Gidget cute. is. Yep. You're so cute. But oh. anyway, um, uh, yeah, I I prayed since the, uh, since the day my children were born. I, I would include their future spouse in my prayers, wherever they were that God would be preparing them and blessing them uh, and, uh, you know, getting them ready to have a, 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 a the, the adventure of a lifetime with my kids. Yeah. And so Cody uh, had been with his girlfriend for eight years before they got married. So he, uh, you know, he, he was absolutely sure. And, uh, and they, she's, I don't know if you've ever seen my children's, my grandchildren's Instagrams, uh, her, her Instagram uh, is just Mrs. Mrs. America. <laughs> a, a, Erica is E R I K A, so it's Mrs. America. America, okay. <laughs> so inventive with these children. Just she, she should have her own show for children, like Miss Miss Rachel. Yeah, you know, she should have one. She's so funny, and and she gets the kids to just just I don't know. She's brilliant. She's brilliant. And then my daughter married um, <clears throat> somebody that uh, 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 the son of a family friend. We had all had homes. We both had homes down in Ocean Reef, Florida, where it was a vacation home for us and uh, private, and we, we could go there without being, you know, harassed. And uh, there's this beautiful family that I became, we became great friends with. And one day, their son, one of their sons had been away at the, um, the a, a tennis camp. And, uh, and uh, uh, we had never met him at first. 
finally one day it was a holiday and he's home and he's at this event and I go yes he's gorgeous and she goes mom he looked like Bjorn Borg was it? Yeah, anyway I was Chris Chris Everett's tennis tennis uh, camp okay school he went to school there boarding school so anyway uh she goes mom but he was he was just the cutest thing in the world and she was 11 at the time he was 14 something like that they're three three and a half years apart like yeah and uh they were best friends ever since they met and even to the point that that his, his, the we parents would say they're gonna get married one day look at wow. them they are gonna get married one day now they have a beautiful little boy named finn who's as different as night and day from cody's kids really? you know the g oh you can tell ex totally that cody's kids cody and erica's children come from gifford side right <laughs> And, 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 and Finn is from, is, uh, is from the Dutch side of, uh, the family, which is uh, the weirdo family, beautiful, beautiful people, but just different. Yeah. And it's funny. His name is Finn, but we call him Finston Churchill because he makes the funniest <laughs> faces. <laughs> oh, just Finston Churchill. <laughs> and then there's a new one too, right? Ford. And now Ford, no, he, Ford and Cody look like the exact same child. That's exactly. what I was about to say. Cody's got some strong genes because the babies and the face. Oh, oh yeah. God. I thought my children were gorgeous when they were born. I really did. But these these new grandchildren, <laughs> put them to shame. <laughs> that is so fun. Put by a loving grandmother for sure. So tell me about the name Bubby. How did you, is that the name you chose before the first baby was born? Bub, it's pronounced Bubby. Booby. And nobody gets it right, so don't feel bad. Bub, <laughs> it's a it's a Yiddish, which is you know Jewish Yiddish word for grandma. Okay. I didn't want to be I didn't want to be grandma. I sure as heck don't want to be granny. I didn't want to be um, grandmother, and I didn't want to be uh, uh, glamma. All the what I just I looked at all of them. I said I don't want to be any of those things. I need something unique. So I have a very dear friend whose uh, mother is Israeli. And I said, she, she, she sends me Yiddish books and they're hysterically funny. So I said, uh, what's the, what's the Yiddish word for, for, um, grandmother. And she goes, booby, you know, bubula. Oh, my little bubula, bubula, bubula. <laughs> so I said, that's it. I knew immediately. If the trouble is Cody FaceTimed me yesterday with, 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 uh, Frankie. And he goes, mom, I just asked him if he wanted to call booby. I said, would you stop it, Cody? My name is booby. It's like wood, boob, boob. And he goes, mom, that's what he calls you. And he wanted to talk to you. So do you want to talk to him or not? So <laughs> I've given up. <laughs> it's going to be whatever comes out of their mouth, right? Yeah, exactly. If you haven't tried Bareface Skincare, let me encourage you to change your skincare game and see the difference. Use the code MAMA15 to try any of their medical grade results driven products for 15% off your purchase. You might want to check out the Jennifer's Favorites bundle. The bundle includes the liquid gold vitamin C serum and the Bareface hydrating lotion. I use both of these twice daily and love them. When you purchase the bundle, you will receive the travel size toning pads as a free gift with purchase. I'll put the link to order in the show notes or just visit barefaced.com and search the word Jennifer. I hear great feedback from those of you who have tried coat defense on your pets. Since we've been using the sensitive skin shampoo on Tucker, he is less scratchy and more shiny. In between baths, coat defense daily preventative powder is a game changer. It eliminates the bacteria that causes odor and unlike a typical deodorant or spray, coat defense doesn't mask the odor, it eliminates it. Tucker's friends at Coat Defense are offering you 15% off to try the Daily Preventative Powder or any of their other awesome products that they offer for pets health. Just use the code MAMA15 at checkout. I wanted to go back to the book. It's, it's never, never too late. You mentioned that just a minute, a minute ago, but I was curious to know when you were dealing, so many of my listeners are at this stage where kind of I am or just behind me or, but, um, did you go through the same fears that moms do for, about the empty nest and what was next for you? Because you had built so much of your, you know, life around your children. It's so easy to put our identity in our role as a mom, but did you struggle with that as well? I feel like there's such great advice in the book. No, I've never been one of those mothers that hovered, never been a helicopter mother. I've always felt like I, I've always just trusted God with them. You know, God can do a much better job with my children than I can. I'll do the best I can by the grace of God. But ultimately, 
they have to, I never wanted to force my faith on my children. I don't think that's right. I think God gives every single person uh, freedom of will. And uh, I wanted them to discover their, their own personal walk with Jesus. And they both did. I'm grateful for that. Cody actually went to Oxford University in England and uh, he'd been, he didn't know what he believed and, and he knew he had an idea, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't solidified. And by studying C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, when he was there, he knew, yeah, that's, that's, I want what they have. I, I first of all, Cody was a difficult teenager. As a, you know, they say psychologists will tell you that the, the, the more type A, the stronger the mother is in, in a boy's child, a boy a life, a boy's life, mm -hmm. the the more the more difficult the child feels like he needs to become almost to the point of obnoxious just so he can tear away naturally uh, separate from from a, a strong mother mm -hmm. well i must be strong mother because i mean i was ready to drop kick him to usc film school i really was i'd had it and um uh, and but but he worked all those things out by the grace of god he, we never were estranged like that it's just that you know he just had issues and he had to deal with them. I mean, this is a kid that grew up in the limelight. This is a kid that had not just one famous parent, but two. Right. Their right. father in some circles was far more famous than I was. Yeah. You know, so he got it coming and going. But when they did leave, they both left for Southern California. Cassidy wanted to become an actress. She already was an actress. She started acting when she was 11. Mm -hmm. And Cody wanted to write films, films and, uh, and he decided he did not want to be in front of the camera. He liked he likes producing and he likes the business aspect of things. He's a brilliant writer. And I was happy to have them on their on their road. You know, I didn't I knew it was a long way to go to see them or for them to come back. But I, my parents encouraged my dreams so much when I was 17 years old. They let me leave home. Wow. They let me leave home and uh, they never questioned it. They knew me. They'd raised me. They were excited for me. They knew they knew early on that they had a um, a unique child in me. <laughs> you know, they had three children, but none of them were like me. And uh, and I was the one that was always putting on the carnival. I was the one that always writing the newspaper. I was the one that was always, you know, uh, putting on shows. Yeah, dressing the dog and putting on shows, usually for charity. Uh, I got kicked out of the brownies when I was seven or eight. I don't know. I got kicked out of Sunday school when I was 10. I got sick, kicked out of the uh, America's Junior Miss pageant when I was, when I was what, 17? 17, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just, I was, uh, I was, I was not a committee girl. I was not a, I, 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 I didn't fall for the, for the propaganda that people, I, I joined the brownies to see the world. All I saw was the beanie on the girl in front of me. That's not, that, that's sorry. That's not fun. And so I started my own brownie troop and they kicked, they kicked me out. So. That's so funny. Because <laughs> you asked how difficult it was. Yeah. There was a point that came um, after Frank passed. Uh, the, ki the kids obviously went back to um, to LA to, to pursue their dreams. And I was alone in, in this gorgeous, huge, rambling, magnificent home to our family for thir almost 30 years by that time uh, on the Long Island, on the line, Long Island Sound with the skyline of New York in our backyard and you know just a just a magical place one time Kevin Costner was staying with us with his daughter and he just just plopped down in the grass in our backyard he goes it's a movie set and I went I know I know and we felt grateful every single day uh that we lived in that house uh, Frank and I would laugh and say you know what honey we I just hope that the people that really own this house never come back and make us <laughs> kick us out and we felt like squatters all that time but um Anyway, uh, we always had a thing that we did as a family. Frank and I, since we were a couple, we would every night toast toast the sunset and thank God for the day that we had just had, you know. And it was a, always a, a time of getting centered again in what was really important, no matter what was going on in our life. Yeah. And uh, then when the kids came along, they they did too. They had their babas and then they had their uh, tippy cups. And then as they got older, they had whatever they were having. And uh, it just became a, a beautiful part of our, our family experience. And one night after Frank had been gone several years and I, all I had was my puppy with me, uh, you know, I couldn't, I would go out with, during the sunset and try to try to toast it. Mm. And I, couldn't, I just couldn't muster any joy about it. That's when God started to convince me it was time to leave uh, Hoda and the Today Show and all of that and leave that complete life we'd I'd have there for almost 40 years and make a new start. 
and I, and I, and I, you know, new beginnings, a new everythings, I called it. And I wrote a song about it. That's in the movie I wrote for Craig Ferguson called then came you. I don't know if you've seen it, but I think you'd like it. I haven't. A, I've seen I've seen all the Hallmark movies, the Godwink movies, and all of those. Oh no, you gotta like you gotta see a movie I wrote for Kev uh, for um uh Craig Ferguson. You know who he is, the Scottish yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh I you love the movie that. and and we're in it. Huh? You wrote the movie and you were in it, right? Oh, I wrote it for the two of us to do. You will love it. It's it, it we shot it in uh, the Highlands of Scotland. And it's a romantic comedy for people that have given up on ever having romance again in their life and then think nothing's funny anymore. Uh -huh. And he is brilliant in it. I co-wrote all the music for the movie with uh, one of the best writers uh, in, in the business, uh, a guy named Brett James, who wrote, you know, uh, has 26 or 20, maybe by now 30, yeah. number one. And he wrote uh, uh, Jesus Take the Wheel. And so many, a lot of Carrie Underwood's big, big hits. So for a year, I was coming back and forth, back and forth to uh, the, the Nashville area to get all the music ready. I Nobody writes the music before they do a movie. Right. But I do. I do. I know exactly where I want a song. I know what I wanted to say. I, I'll bring the whiskey. I'll bring the wine. I'll get my guitar. I'll go and get mine. I'll wear my new lace. I'll wear my old leather. We, we were made to make music together. I mean, I just, I knew what the movie should be. What happened then was I would get on a plane on a Sunday night after working all weekend long with bread. And I'd say to, on my way back to do the Today Show and I'd go, and an empty house, keep that in mind. I would get on that plane to go home and I'd go, why am I so happy here? Mm. Why am I so filled with joy here? I haven't haven't felt this way in so long. That was such a bold move of you when you picked up and moved to Nashville and left that lifestyle you'd had for so long. But it kind of, again, goes back to the book. One of the things you said, I wrote it down, God is still dreaming big for our years ahead. Like, even if we're not, God is. And I think that that's, that's right. such an important message. And so you knew you have still had and still have so much left to do. And and to Mostly just the encourage dreams that I've never keep yeah doing. the dreams that had always been there that yeah. I never had the time to pursue and right. they haven't all come true. I mean my little my little movie that I did with Craig then came you was um, got some wonderful reviews. It was a number one movie in the in in the country for a you know, like a couple of weeks. But it was during COVID, so mm -hmm. it never did what it could do. But you can still get it. You can still still download it. And I did I did a movie called The Way, which I worked four years on and. People don't know that about me. You know, they yeah. think all I did was sit on a stool next to Regis or Hoda and just try to be kind of goofy. That's like maybe 10% of who I am. You know, the rest is pretty darn serious. But uh, anyway, what's your story about uh, Brett James? Oh, my story about Brett James is so this is so my son that's getting married in April. Uh, Brett and my our kids went together. So Preston, his oldest, graduated with my oldest. And then his daughter, Claire, graduated with Connor. And, and from Claire Pepperdine? Uh, no, from Brentwood Academy here in Nashville. Oh, 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 here locally. High uh -huh. Yeah, high school. But Claire was um, Connor's first little middle school girlfriend. And so Brett and I she loved her. Precious. She's a doll. <laughs> She's a doll, an yeah. absolute doll. I do want to make sure that we talk about your online Bible studies, that people who are missing you can actually take part. And those just started this week? Well, no, they've been, they've been up. Okay. I, I mentioned the way. And it's and there's and there's a companion book to the way called the God of the Way. Okay. And, and people can get that. That that was a big big um, a book too. And I, when I say that, I'm just grateful because all of all of my profits go back to my kingdom work. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, mean, I can I can still go over. I can go to Israel and still, here he is. Oh, 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 always little bitty. You want to say hello to Jennifer? Hello. Hey, this is Bambino. Oh my goodness! How old is Bambino now? He's going to be 13 this month. Wow. You know, oh I know he was just a fur ball. He was just a little two ounce fur ball or something. I like know. That. I can remember when you talking about him, when you first got him, how can people access those Bible studies? Yeah, well, they can go on my website and find okay. everything we've been talking about. It's just, okay. that's the easy thing to do. Uh, uh, I haven't done anything I'm not proud of. So, you know, you're not going to find any porn there. Not yet, but anyway, <laughs> you're still dreaming big dreams. Oh, <laughs> Oh, those, I never had that dream. And trust me, nobody, even the <laughs> biggest freaks in the world wouldn't want to see that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, I went, I did that. Uh, There's something that I'd done with the Nicole C. Mullen called The God of the Way. Yes. No, no, The God Who Sees. 
the God Who Sees. And I had, that was the first oratorio I had written and uh, with her. And uh, we went to Israel and we shot it. And it was, I mean, millions and millions of people have seen it. It's had healing properties with it. It's just the story of Hagar and Ruth and uh, David hiding, you know, broken in, in the wilderness, broken in the desert. And then Mary Magdalene, it ends with that. And it's it's just, it, I had no idea what I was doing when I was, I was just under the power of the Holy Spirit, just writing, writing, writing. We thought we were writing one song for Don, for Danny Goki to sing about Hagar. Oh. And it just, it took on a, an unbelievable life of its own. It okay. starts with the God of the how and when, you know, about waiting on God's promises. Mm -hmm. And that's like Abraham and Sarah, you know, all these people that had to wait for God's promises, whatever God speaks is, is perfect. And as for, as for the Lord, his way is perfect. His flawless, the, the word of God says. So um, if he, if he promises something, you can, you know, you can guarantee it will happen, but it won't happen probably the way you think. And when it should, when, when you let go and let God I, it's just so much more fun and exciting a, a journey when you watch God just go to work. Mm -hmm. He is the, the creator of all things and the sustainer of all things. Why wouldn't I want it to put it in his hands? Yeah. You know, exactly. yeah. yeah, he's better at things than, than I am. You know, I've, I've learned that. So and I, anyway, so that there's that, the God of his word, the Danny Gokey's uh, the host of that one. Uh -huh. Then the third one, the one with the uh, uh, sweet Nicole. And then the fourth one, if you want to have your socks blown off, uh, you can go to Lewis, as in St. Louis, York, as in New York, Lewis York on YouTube. Oh, this is the new song you have out. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's 70. Oh, what it's am amazing. I supposed to do with you? What am I supposed to say to you now that I let love in? It's so good. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah. It's so, they are so good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything they wrote the final oratorio with me, and it's uh, oh my gosh, it's more than it's the longest one, it's 20 minutes more than 20 minutes long. And because people don't, you know, when you don't study uh, uh, rabbinically, the scriptures are in black and white basically, but when you study rabbinically, all the technicolor comes through. You, are, you start to understand culturally what was going on, you start to understand geopolitically what was going on. And it takes on a brilliance and a, and, a, and a gravitas. The word of God takes on so much more meaning when you study that way. So I thought when Jesus said, get in the boat and go to the other side, like most uh, believers and people that study the Bible, but have never been taught this way. I just thought he meant just go to the other side of the, of the, of the Sea of Galilee, never thinking anything of it. No, the, the other side was a specific place, very specific place that Jews all of their lives have been told, never go to the other side. That's like you as a wonderful, like a Mormon mother saying, don't you dare go to Vegas, you know? <laughs> yeah. Don't you dare. Yeah. And when Jesus said that, first of all, Jewish people do not like the water because bad things happen on the water. Jonah gets eaten by a fish. You know, the, the, the people almost get swallowed up by the Red Sea. Uh, you know, the water has, uh, they've always had a healthy fear of water. Uh -huh. And there are these big storms that come up. There's squalls that come up on the Sea of Galilee and they can, you know, totally uh, overturn your, your vessels. And they'd hurt. That's why the fishermen there would only, only go almost just a hundred yards offshore. They'd never go out into the middle of the, of the, That's of the sea. Fascinating. Yeah. Now Jesus would say, no, you're going to follow me or not. I'm going to go pray and I'll meet you on the other side. And they're going, what? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, we've never been there. He said, well, if you're going to follow, if you're going to, if you're going to be my followers, you have to follow me, you know, and don't ask, just go. You never ask a rabbi where you're going or what he's going to teach you. That's, that's a no, no. You just trust. You just follow in his footsteps. I feel like I've been to an online Bible study this morning. Well, thank a you. So you're a personal to answer to your question, I mean, because we've already had that you can already get the God of the how and when and you can already get uh, the God of his word. Right. And the newest one that we're now coming out with this week is uh, called um, is, is the God who sees the one with Nicole. Gotcha. Okay. And then and in a couple, and this one is done with my dear friend, uh, Joanne Moody. The, the first two were done with my friend, Rabbi Sobel, who I'm, I've written quite a quite a few good books with yeah. Rock the Road and Rabbi and all those books. Okay. Yeah, that one, that one changed, that one changed the world, you know, before COVID, hi, sweetheart, come to mama, before COVID, if you want, got on a, a flight going to Israel, you'd look around 
three out of five passengers were going to were reading uh, the the Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi. It became the number one tourist book for anybody going to Israel. Oh, that's because so cool. I, took, I, I I was started to write it about my experiences studying rabbinically in in, in Israel, the Holy Land, and uh, I realized uh, about fifty pages in that I I had a pamphlet. I didn't have a book, and I so I called my friend, who's just a genius rabbi. And just and my and I adore him, a great teacher. And I said, uh, "Will you mind doing this book with me, Rabbi? Because I, uh, everything I know, I've learned from other people. I'm not a I'm not a biblical scholar, right. but I studied with them. I studied with him, and so he did. And I thought that it would sell maybe ten thousand copies because I just at that time felt like nobody was really very spiritually interested in anything. There was no hunger. It seemed mm -hmm. everybody was happy sitting in their same pew." year after year after year, sending a check maybe every year at the end, you know, to, to Africa for, you know, whatever. Yeah. And there was no life to the church, no joy. It was just rote, you know, it's just like a rut. And that's not true of every church, but that, too many churches were like that. And so I just thought, I don't know why the Lord had me write this book, but I'm writing it anyway. He told me to, so I'm doing it. And uh, I, it sold, I, I think it's, it's well over 700,000 copies now. And, you know, I'm so grateful because I literally uh, the, the the money that I made, the profits from those royalties on that book is what paid for the God who sees. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. It all, it's all, it, 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 just feeds it. it feeds it, you know? Yeah. So I keep putting these books that people are, God love them. They buy them. And it, it just puts the money into the coffers. I'm like the, I'm like the widow with the Elijah's oil. You know? <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. It's been such a delight to get to talk to you. Will you leave us just with a little bit of advice from your experiences um, to moms at the stage where you're trying to figure out like what's next for you, just to encourage us to keep dreaming big and figuring out what their next is? Well, you've already, you just said it all. I mean, uh, when the Bible says that when your children call you blessed, it's a beautiful thing. It's a great, great, great. Motherhood is a gift. Motherhood is a gift. And um, so I just want everybody to rethink in, in spite of how difficult motherhood is. It's the hardest job in the whole world, I think, to do it well, to do it well. I, I can't even imagine how, how a single mother with children uh, and no help uh, is making it in this world today. I pray for them. I, so instead of giving advice, why don't I just pray for everybody? Oh, I would okay. love that. That would yeah. be an honor. Yes. Let's yeah, let's, let me just pray for everybody. Lord Jesus, first of all, we lift up our hands to you in praise and give you all honor and authority and glory because you are Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides for us. You are Jehovah El Roy, the God who sees. You are Jehovah Yahweh. You are, there's so many names for you, Lord, but we know that you're our friend. You are our friend. You are our savior, our rock and our redeemer. Yes, but you are the friend. You came for all those who were crushed in spirit. You came for all those who were brokenhearted. And Lord, that's many of us. And it's all of us at one point or other in our life. We will go through that. Let us cling to the hand that is scarred for us, Lord. You are the only one in all of history who has proven how much you love us. Proven. You're the only person ever born with the express purpose to die. And you left glory to come and be that for us. We just praise you and thank you. Let us never take that gift for granted, Lord. We lift up our children to you now. We lift up our kids that we love with all our hearts, but our love isn't perfect like yours is, Lord. Give us wisdom with our children. Let us see them each individually like you did and not just our kids. No, each child is precious and individual. Never let us forget that, Lord. If snowflakes have a different DNA, what about our children, Lord? They're just so special. Help us to be the best we can be. And we can only be the best if we are clinging to you. Thank you for our spouses if we still are blessed to have them. And if we're still blessed to love them, all the more. Thank you for them, Lord. Keep our love alive. Help us not to, um, uh, to neglect our partners during this journey. And may the men in our lives uh, realize how important they are to the journey for their children. I pray for that, Lord. Men have been emasculated so much in our in our world today. I pray now. I want them to have what, what Joshua yelled when they went in to take the promised land. He'd go, Kana, which was the battle cry to take the land. 
May we be married to men like that, Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray for our world. We pray for the hostages who by, they have done nothing wrong, Lord, and they're being held in, in total, utter despair. We pray that you will set the captives free. We pray, Lord, for our leaders. So many of them do not know you, Lord, and so we, we have no leadership. We have no guidance. We have no, um, it, it, nothing seems purposeful and nothing seems good for us. It's just, it's chaos, Lord, and we need shalom. We need shalom in our lives personally, and we need your shalom in this world, Lord. That, when you created this world, is what was hovering over the chaos. The, 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 the nothingness was, was chaos in, in Hebrew. And above it, what, what you're hovering over it, you were the shalom. And that doesn't just mean peace. That means every attribute that we give to you, Lord, your justice, your loving kindness, your faithfulness, your everything, everything that's good and perfect about you, Lord, is your shalom. And so we want that in our lives, Lord, and that's what we seek today. I pray for all my brothers and sisters in Jesus all over the world, especially those, Lord, who are being persecuted for loving you, for loving you. Be with them, Lord. Comfort them. Strengthen them. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for Jennifer and the lovely, really lovely ministry she has with her podcast, Lord. I bless her. And Lord, uh, we pray for the, her son that's getting married. I think it's, you love marriage. Your first miracle was wine to water at a wedding. Uh, what a beautiful picture of your plans for your children. So Lord, we all have lives we have to get to now, so we can't keep praying. I just wanted to thank you and lift up these beautiful, beautiful human beings to you in your holy name. Amen. Thank you. What a precious gift for you to do that. You need to let me know if there's a time and if I'm around, we'll, we'll have a, a glass, a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Glass or whatever. Of wine or I would love that. That would be awesome. Awesome. Okay, sweetheart. Thank Lord you bless you. Time. Thank you. you I hope you have a wonderful day. And tell Christy, thank you for setting everything up. I will, sweetheart. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.